गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन वेलकम टू ऑल द ट्रेनिंग हु हैव जॉइंड अस इन द यूट्यूब चैनल टू रिवाइज द सर्जिकल मैनेजमेंट ऑफ एल यू टी एस इन अवर जर्नी ऑन एफ आर सी एस यूर ऑल प्रिपरेशन टूडे वी हैव अ ट्रेनिंग एंड वी आर कंटिन्यूइंग अवर एल यू टी एस मैनेजमेंट एस यू ऑल नो इन द लास्ट पार्ट वी हैव सीन द मेडिकल मैनेजमेंट ऑफ एल यू टी एस टूडे वी आर डिस्कसिंग द सर्जिकल एस्पेक्ट्स अनिश फोर सीयर्स Thank you so much. Uh, so we will uh, go straight to the scenario. Um, there is a 68-year-old gentleman with BPH, pre-referred by your GP. His prostate size is 80 gram from his previous investigations. PSA of four. On tamoxifen and finasteride for 18 months. he still has bothered some voiding lutes with an ipss of 20 plus 5 mm. flow rate and bladder scan showed voided volume 315 qmax 8 q average 4 with a post void residual of 32 uh in your further history he enjoys a satisfactory sex life with his partner uh how are you going to proceed and what else do you want to know in the history So um, um I want to see the patient in the uh, clinic um I want to make sure that he is compliant with the uh, medication uh, I want to know specifically which symptoms causing uh, bother for him um um uh, I get the information of the IPSS fluid and the bladder scan um I think you said you his PSA is 4 currently and he is <laughs> using tamoxifen and finasteride uh, for a while and uh since he's using finasteride for more than 6 month uh then his actual psa will be 8 uh, rather than 4 because we need to multiply it and 8 is a little bit high for his age of 68 mm-hmm. so i will be keen to do a dysterectal examination for this uh, patient make sure that there is no uh, reason for false elevation of a psa i would compare the psa over a time uh, while he was using finasteride because uh, we know that when patient is using finasteride the psa should be reduced to about 50% within 6 to 12 month and then it will be stay over another and it is not expected to to increase so if there is an increment Uh, over the last um, uh, year and uh, the psa currently is 8 uh, this raises a suspicion of prostate cancer so i will um, have a, a low threshold to consider uh, mri scan plus minus biopsy um, regarding the symptoms uh, i will discuss with the patient to see what's his expectations and if he is not happy to continue with the medical treatment uh, then i will discuss with the patient uh, the surgical option for treatment of uh, bladder outlet obstruction all right so uh, his uh, psa has been remaining stable for a long time uh, his mri scan shows that it is normal no abnormal lesions in the mri scan um so uh, regarding the options uh, what are the options that you're going to discuss with him he's in front of you Yeah so um as you know currently the um uh, treatment the surgical treatment option for bladder outlet obstruction are quite uh, uh wide so i will um, discuss with the patient uh at first i want to see the patient characteristic and then we can discuss the patient wishes and then we'll have a a decision both of us um there are some patient patient characteristic which determined uh, which treatment he is fit for mm-hmm. so according to the um, european uh, uh, guidelines uh, they have like a flow algorithm uh, for the choice of treatments so the first thing is that whether the, the first question is whether the patient is fit for general anesthesia or not mm-hmm. if he is fit for general anesthesia then we have a few options for that if he is not fit for general anesthesia then we have to choose a, a treatment which is done under local anesthesia or sedation so if the prostate is a uh, uh, atm like this patient he can have a a, a urolift and also he may have a, a prostate artery uh, embolization this is the other option uh, if the uh, patient is fit for general anesthesia then the next question whether he is using any anticoagulant whether he can stop them or not if he can't stop his anticoagulation then we need a, a surgical treatment with a very good hemostasis 
and the laser offer this uh, option. So I will offer the patient to have either HOLIP or a, a green light uh, uh, vaporization of the prostate. Mm -hmm. If the patient is fit for general anesthesia and not using anticoagulant, then we have a lot of options. Here, uh, the uh, prostate size will uh, come into play. And for this patient with a prostate volume of uh, 80 mil, uh, I can offer him uh, uh, ablative uh, surgery. Uh, I can offer him uh, resective surgery. Uh, like uh, monopuram bipolar 2RP uh, or uh, uh, thorium vapor resection or aquablation. Also, I can offer him a uh, vaporization surgery uh, like uh, bipolar uh, TUVP uh, and uh, the uh, green light laser. I can offer him inoculative surgery like um, holip uh, and uh, tholip. Uh, which can be offered as well. And I can offer him uh, an ablative uh, uh, surgery without resection, like resume, uh, and also uh, non-ablative uh, uh, option like Eurolift and uh, ITIND. So this is, uh, this is a quite extensive algorithm from the European guideline. However, mm -hmm. a nice guideline. Uh, we don't have this specification and mainly uh, guidelines recommend to offer the patient uh, monopolar bipolar TRP, uh, TUVP, uh, or uh, HOLIP. Uh, the other uh, new modality, most of them, they are approved by NICE. Mm -hmm. uh, however, they need to be done in a, a clinical trial setting. Well done, well done. Um, yeah, so that was a really lengthy discussion, and I I put that eight T deliberately in this discussion because, as you know, this is a long discussion compared to the ten minutes discussion in the exam. Yes. Uh, so eight is the watershed area where the EAU guidelines say that it can be either. So uh, we, we will move on to discuss uh, each the evidence and the details of the most common and the uh, promising upcoming things. Um, yeah. So in general, to start with the surgical management of BPH, uh, what are the indications for if, when you absolutely uh, decide to do, go ahead with the surgery? Yeah, the, the main indication is failure of medical treatment or interest medical uh, therapy. Uh, number two is uh, refractory urinary retention, three, uh, high pressure chronic urinary retention, um, recurrent UTI, uh, recurrent uh, uh, hematuria due to prostatic enlargement, not responding to 5-alpha uh, reductase inhibitor uh, therapy, deterioration of renal uh, function, uh, development of uh, bladder stone, and the patient wish. So these are the main indication. Okay. Uh, in your practice, uh, what is a standard uh, option that you give uh, to a patient with a prostate of 80 gram? Um, in my practice, uh, I will, as I as I said uh, earlier, I will exclude the, uh, the things which may dictate a specific type of treatment, uh, mm -hmm. like the uh, fitness for general anesthesia, uh, anticoagulation or not. And then if the patient is fit for general anesthesia, not using anticoagulant, uh, for this patient, I will um, uh, consider uh, for this, this size of 80, uh, uh, mil, 80 mil, I will offer him uh, either bipolar to RP, uh, uh, Eurolift, uh, uh, bipolar inoculation of the prostate, uh, or HOLIP. Uh, it depends also on an um, important question about what is the patient's expectation and the priorities regarding sexual life. So if the patient is interested in having uh, ejaculation preserving the procedure, uh, then I will go more towards the minimal invasive treatment uh, like uh, uh, Eurolift, uh, Resume, um, ITIND, while if, he's, if his priority is to have one procedure which give him the maximum um, uh, durable benefit, then I will go with the um, inoculation procedure like HOLIP. Okay. Uh, regarding the technique of TURP, uh, imagine the patient is consented, the WH checklist is done, antibiotics given, popped and raved, you have done the DRE as well. Uh, what is your uh, preferred method of doing TURP? Um, how, how, would, how, how would you do TURP? 
Yes, my preferred method is to do a, a bipolar 2RP. I'm quite familiar with the tourist uh, system. Um, so I will do cystoscopy uh, first. Um, if the meatus is a little bit tight, I will do uterine dilatation or uh, otis before I start. And then I will do a cystoscopy, assess the anatomy of the prostatic urethra, look at the external sphincter, the vero, the bladder neck, and check both uretric orifices uh, location. Make sure that there is no incidental finding like bladder tumor or a stone. After that, I'll introduce the resectoscope and I start uh, uh, resecting. Um, I use the uh, Blandy method. I will start to section at the, uh, at the base of the prostate between five to seven o'clock down to the circular uh, fibers of the capsule. After that, I will go to the lateral loop and start making a tunnel at two and uh, 10 o'clock. And then this articulate the lateral loops um, and then I will resect the lateral loops um, as much as possible down to the capsule. Uh, and finally, I will resect the apical tissue uh, near the vero montanum. I'll make sure that there is a good um, hemostasis. I will achieve a good hemostasis uh, with the mushroom. Uh, and then um, I will take all the chips uh, out with the LK evacuator, remove all the clots. Um, and then if everything is fine, I'm happy with the appearance of both your orifices zero away from the resection. Um, then I will uh, insert a, a 22 French three-way uh, catheter, um, make sure that I uh, examine the, the abdomen of the patient uh, to exclude any extravasation or perforation of the uh, bladder. Uh, and then according to the color of the irrigation, if it is uh, clear, I will not do a uh, traction, but if there is some bleeding, I will apply uh, a gentle traction over the um, catheter, keep it for 10 to 15 minutes, which may help to control the bleeding. Um, usually I will go with the patient myself to the recovery, make sure that irrigation, everything is running in a good way. And I will ask the uh, recovery nurses to keep the patient for at least an hour. So I will see him after my next patient to make sure that everything is fine. Uh, usually uh, I will give two further doses of uh, antibiotic for the patient, especially if he's having a, a end willing catheter prior to the uh, a procedure um, and uh, usually we run the irrigation uh, for uh, at on average 24 hour next morning if the, everything is fine irrigation is clear we can uh, talk the patient uh, he will be discharged and then i will see him in uh, about uh, 8 to 12 week uh, with uh, ipss fluoride and the bladder scan and i will send the resected tissue for histology okay uh, what is the retreatment rate of uh, TRP? So the retreatment rate of TRP uh, uh, is in the area of one to two percent per year. So most of the studies they got a retreatment rate of about eight percent in uh, eight year. Okay. Uh, when you counsel the patient for TRP, um, well, uh, regarding the complication part, what are the uh, complications that you expect? Uh, after doing it, you are. So I'll cancel patient according to the uh, pulse uh, leaflet. Um, uh, the expected complication is the anesthesia related uh, complication, mm -hmm. um, uh, a bleeding which may happen in about 2% of the patient, uh, which may require, sorry, the bleeding will uh, require blood transfusion in about 2% of the patient. Um, there is a, a low possibility of uh, uh, a need for to bring the patient back to theater in about 0.6 uh, percent uh, infection uh, rate is about two to three uh, percent uh, the specific complication of uh, trp is a uh, lack of ejaculation which happened in about 70 to 80 percent of the patient um, deterioration in sexual function about two to two to ten percent of the patient um, on the long term, uh, uh, the risk of uterus structure and the bladder neck contracture is about two to ten percent. Uh, um, the other risk is um, there is a low possibility of uh, having a TUR uh, syndrome uh, with the monopolar. However, with the bipolar, we don't have uh, this problem. The incidence of TUR syndrome is ranging between 0.5 up to two percent. Uh, depend on the size of the prostate and the resection uh, uh, time. Um, retreatment rate for TRP, as I explained, is about 1% per year. 
All right. Um, so what are the advantages, uh, apart from TUR syndrome, of using a bipolar TURP? So according to a Cochrane review, uh, which compared the monopolar uh, versus the bipolar TURP, uh, in terms of improvement of the uh, QMAX and IPS as quality of life, both of them are comparable. Uh, however, uh, bipolar TRP showed a favorable um, outcome uh, regarding uh, less blood loss, uh, less incidence of uh, complication, and uh, uh, sorry, less incidence of complication, uh, less uh, blood loss, and. Uh, Anything regarding the catheterization time? Yes, exactly. So less catheterization time for the patient, uh, less bleeding, less overall uh, complication, and we exclude the possibility of uh, bipolar TRP. Uh, sorry, we exclude the possibility of uh, TR syndrome. TR syndrome. Okay. Uh, what are the types of um, uh, bipolar uh, TR sets available, or bipolar systems available? Um, the one that I'm aware of is the tourists uh, from Olympus, uh, and there is also a uh, uh, gyrus. Okay. So, um, the, uh, the types are, in general, there are two types, as we know, there are true, there are true bipolar systems and the quasi-bipolar systems. Yes, yeah. And in, in the true one, uh, the active pole and the passive pole is situated uh, at the receptoscope tip. But in the quasi one, the sheet acts as the passive pole. Yeah, I think Taurus is a, a cozy bipolar, while Jaras is a true bipolar. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, are you aware of the bipolar transurethral vaporization of the prostate? Uh, yes. So this is a technology recently approved by uh, by Nice guidelines. Um, so it. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's mainly from uh, Olympus, this technique. It's called the plasma technique, mm -hmm. in which uh, they use a high-frequency generator, which will provide uh, more energy, which will cause uh, uh, vaporization of the prostate tissue in addition to um, ablative necrosis. Um, so it's different from the um, bipolar 2 RP, that it vaporizes the tissue. And most of the time, there is no resection of the tissue. There are no chips, uh, but we are using uh, like a hovering uh, movement or near contact movement, which will cause um, uh, vaporization uh, of the uh, prostate tissue. It uses a higher energy. So the resection uh, setting usually in the bipolar TRP is about 280 watt, while here it may increase up to 320 uh, watt and the coagulation as well in the bipolar to RP is 125 watt, uh, while um, here it is uh, about 180 watt. Okay, well done. And regarding uh, the transurethral incision of prostate, uh, when will you do TUIP? So the TUIP, um, according to the NICE guideline and the European guidelines, mainly preserved for patients with a smaller prostate less than 30 mil. Uh, or the patient is young and he wants to preserve his uh, ejaculation. Okay. And uh, nowadays there is more uh, favoring regarding the uh, laser procedures, especially for la very large prostates. Uh, regarding the homium laser inoculation of the prostate, uh, what type of laser is homium? Uh, uh, Holmium laser uh, is a, a YAG laser, uh, which have a wavelength of 2140 nanometer. Um, it has a, a, a penetration into the tissue of 0.4 millimeter. And uh, the chromo, the chromo for, for um, uh, Holmium laser is uh, water. Uh, however, it has a, a very good uh, homostatic um, uh, properties uh, as well. It can be used for stone and for the prostate um, as well. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, what, what is the advantage of uh, HOLEB compared to TRP? Yeah, so there is a, a study which compared between uh, HOLEB and TRP. It is uh, Almancy 2011. 
uh, with a follow-up for about 10 years. Uh, so both uh, techniques are uh, comparable in improving uh, the IPSS, uh, the QMAX, and the quality of life. However, the improvement in QMAX is superior with the uh, HOLIP. Uh, and the other thing is the durability of the study. The retreatment rate uh, with uh, HOLIP is quite low, which is about 1% to 2% in 10 years, uh, compared to about 10% for TRP uh, in 10 years. Uh, HOLIP is quite versatile that we can use it in different sizes of the prostate, uh, starting from uh, 30 mil um, up to 200 uh, mil. Um, I am aware of a recent study by Boxall, which show that the, tre the treatment outcome and safety of HOLIP for prostate volume more than 80 uh, mil are comparable to those for HOLIP for smaller prostate less than 80 uh, mil, which showed a quite uh, uh, safe and durable effect of HOLIP. Uh, how does uh, thulium laser differ from homium laser? So the thulium fiber laser is uh, produced, uh, the source of the energy is a diode laser. Most of other laser, the source of energy is a flash lamp, which will uh, pass into a special resonator. And then there is uh, two, two mirrors, and then we have the laser. While in the diode laser, while in the thulium laser, it is, uh, the gener it is generated from a diode laser. Uh, so usually it is more quiet. Uh, the instrument is uh, smaller. Uh, however, it is uh, more expensive and uh, um, we have less power. So the maximum we can get uh, is uh, 60 watt power with the thulium. Okay. And uh, well done. And also it's good to mention that uh, the thulium is a continuous wave mode compared to homium, which is a pulsed wave mode. Okay, thank you. And uh, coming to the green light laser, uh, what are the types of green light laser that we are aware of? So we use the uh, uh, green light laser, the KTP, uh, YAG laser. So um, in this one, uh, the KTP crystal, which is potassium titanyl uh, phosphate, uh, with the laser will pass through uh, the laser beam will pass through the crystals which will uh, double the frequency and half the wavelength mm -hmm. so the wavelength of the green light laser is uh, 534 nanometer and it is in the visible uh, spectrum of the uh, light uh, the green light uh, laser prostrectomy mainly used in the form of vaporization uh, however uh, some of the quite experienced surgeons they are doing inoculation with the green light um, as well. It is a side it's a side firing uh, it's a side uh, firing laser mm -hmm. and used in a non-contact uh, method uh, with a very good hemostatic property since the chromophore for the green light laser is the hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. It has a minimal penetration of about uh, uh, point. Uh, uh, the minimum penetration of about 0.2 uh, mil, sorry, no. The thulium is 0.2, uh, green light laser is 0.4, and the uh, holmium is 0.8 millimeter, the penetration depth. Okay. Um, compared, uh, to comparing the different types of green light laser, the 180 watt, 120 watt, and 80 watt, uh, what's the, what's the, advantage of having the latest 180 watt XPS? So this will, prov will provide more energy, uh, mm -hmm. which will cause a, a better tissue ablation, a better hemostasis and a shorter operative time. Because one of the main disadvantage of the previous uh, generation of green light uh, uh, laser procedure that it take a, a longer time. Uh, most of the time, the hemostasis is very good. Uh, it can be considered for patients who are using uh, anticoagulant uh, medication. Mm -hmm. uh, however, they need to stop it uh, just before the surgery. And uh, most of the time, it's done as a day case. Patients will have the surgery uh, discharge on the same day with the catheter and return back in two to three days for a walk. All right. Uh, so uh, this question was asked in the, uh, during the preparation of one of the viva sessions so the 180 watt as you said it has got more power compared to the previous systems at least 50 percent more power 
And the second thing is that because it has got more power, there is a wider area of effect. So we can we can cover more tissues in less time. Uh, the depth of penetration is two millimeter for the green light. Uh, so it allows for a precise uh, either vaporization or coagulation. Okay. And the good thing about XPS is that uh, we can modify the power of the machine. So we can change between the coagulation setting going to 30 watt and or change to a vaporization, vaporization setting going to 80 to 180 watt. Okay. And the most, uh, uh, one of the other advantages in the field of fibers so it uses this technology where it is a, it's called as a moxie liquid cooled steel capped fibers. <laughs> with that, with that uh, advent, uh, uh, new thing, what has happened is it has increased the longevity, it improves the fracture, and it improves the burning out of that uh, glass fiber, glass fiber covering. It, it is called as de-vitrification. So these are, uh, so if someone asks you regarding the advantage of having the new machine of green light so these are the things that we can see okay so so the fiber is covered by um, a steel rather than a glass it's, it's called as i know it, it is glass but it is called st steel capped so uh, what happens is uh, usually there is uh, burning out of the fiber very quickly mm -hmm. uh, during the laser procedure but this uh, this advanced fiber will allow for less devitrification okay thank you um, regarding the evidence for green light laser, what is the outcome of the Goliath trial? So the Goliath trial was an inferiority uh, a trial compared uh, green light laser to TURP um, and follow up over 24 months, uh, which showed that green light laser is not inferior in terms of improvement in the QMAX, IPSS and uh, quality of life. Um, uh, also, the green light uh, laser was proved more safe with less incidence of bleeding and uh, uh, preoperative complication. Mm -hmm. uh, and however, the, in the Goliath study, the size of the prostate was limited uh, to uh, 80 mil only, uh, and the patients who are using anticoagulant were excluded from the study. Um, I am aware that there is a Goliath 2 study um, coming on soon, but uh, I'm not aware of the outcome of this one. Okay, I think it is still in the trial phase, I mean, the, in the acquisition phase, isn't it? Uh, so what is the five-year uh, surgical retreatment rate of green light laser? So for a green light laser, the uh, five-year uh, treatment rate is... Uh, um, is about uh, something uh, between a three to five uh, percent. Well done, good. Um, and what is the current guidelines? I mean, you already said that. So the guidelines says, says that it is limited to, should be limited to less than 80 mils, uh, but that's theoretically. Uh, yeah. Coming to the other minimally invasive techniques, uh, what is reason? So resume is a uh, water uh, vapor uh, therapy. It uses the uh, hot uh, steam to ablate the prostate tissue. Uh, the resume and resume we need an, uh, a heating source which is a radio frequency cause heating, radio frequency generator which cause heating of the sterilized uh, sterile water into a very hot uh, steam. The temperature reaching about one hundred three degrees Celsius. Um, and then after that, we have a delivery system mm -hmm. through a, a scope into the, uh, uh, the prosthetic urethra. And then we will have inside uh, the system a retractable needle. Mm -hmm. And this retractable needle, on the top of it, uh, there are uh, 12 uh, very small uh, openings. Uh, they are arranged in three rows. Each row contains uh, four uh, openings. Uh, these three rows are at a, a certain angle to each other, which is 120 uh, degree. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, what happens usually is that we will inject this retractable needle into the uh, prostate. The injection will be uh, delivered within uh, nine seconds, and it will cover an area of uh, 1.37 uh, square uh, centimeter within this uh, nine second, and it will cause... Um, uh, widespread uh, ablation of the uh, area. Mm -hmm. 
the temperature of the water of the steam will be uh, 103 while the temperature of the prostate tissue initially is at 37 degree after application of the treatment the average temperature in the prostate tissue will be around uh, 70 degree um, celsius um, and uh, the good thing about uh, the resume that it used uh, uh, heat convection uh, so we can uh, deliver uh, a precise and targeted uh, thermal energy into the tissue and this effect is limited by the capsule of a transitional zone so it's supposed to uh, to uh, ablate the prostate in the transition zone only which is the adenoma rather than going um, outside uh, the prostate uh, the procedure uh, initially may be offered over general anesthesia. However, with a growing uh, confidence in the surgeon and the team, it can be done under uh, local anesthesia with or without uh, sedation. Uh, all the patients will need to have a catheter for at least three to five days, depending on the size of the uh, prostate. Uh, it is contraindicated in patient who is having a penile implant or uh, uh, urinary implants. Uh, because of the concern about the uh, high temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, the effect uh, from uh, resume mainly, or the evidence for resume mainly come from the McVary uh, study. Mm -hmm. He just recently published the five-year uh, series of resume of about 190 patients. Mm -hmm. Showed that resume improved uh, the uh, QMAX, uh, IPSS, and the quality of life by at least uh, 50%. Um, uh, very. Uh, this is uh, this study was uh, com in comparison with sham. So it is resume versus sham. It has a retreatment rate of about 4.4 uh, percent in uh, uh, five years, and it preserved. The complication is mainly uh, transient dysuria, hematuria, um, uh, the, the incidence of retrograde ejaculation is only about uh, three to seven uh, percent. Um, in this patient, therefore, it is a, a good option for patient with uh, prostate 30 to 80 gram who want to preserve his ejaculation. The presence of median loop is not a contraindication for resume, and it doesn't interfere with further therapy after that in case the patient need a, a retreatment. The catheter, uh, there is a, also a small study by McVary uh, uh, on the patient with urinary retention, only 50 patients in this one which showed a catheter free rate of about 81% in 28 uh, days. There is also a study by Garden uh, in 2020 in the World Journal of Urology, which showed that um, resume uh, can be used for even larger prostate. So he compared the outcome of resume for prostate less than 80 mil with uh, prostate more than 80 mil and ensure that the result and improvement are comparable. The only thing is that when we do the resume for larger prostate, the catheter expected to stay longer. And the average time was nine days. And also the incidence of sepsis uh, may be higher. Mm, okay, well done. Um, what is the NICE guidance on uh, using the technology of resume? So resume is approved by the NICE guideline. It's mainly uh, uh, apply uh, mainly used in patients in men above 50 years of age uh, with uh, uh, Q max uh, less than 12 uh, mil per second and IPSS 13 or more and prostate volume between 30 to 80. All right. Moving on to the newer uh, other type of minimal invasive option. Uh, what is aquablation? So aquablation is the water jet uh, therapy. It uses uh, a, a jet of water under high pressure and high speed uh, to cause ablation of the prostate. Uh, it is uh, it needs to be delivered under general anesthesia since the patient should be immobilized during the procedure. Uh, the procedure mainly composed of uh, three parts of the the. Uh, the instrument, it's a uh, transcript ultrasound uh, for real-time assessment of the, uh, the prostate. Uh, and then we have the urethral handpiece, uh, and we have a robotic arm attached uh, to that, in addition to the um, generator for the aqua ablation. Mm -hmm. So the procedure uh, can be done for prostate between 30 to 80 uh, mil. However, they are extending the boundaries uh, more and more currently. Uh, uh, we will start by doing transect ultrasound, 
to have anatomic uh, mapping for the prostate. So it allows us to show um, the transect ultrasound, it allows us to show the whole length of the prostate starting from the bladder neck uh, uh, down to the vero montanum. Uh, and then we will introduce the urethral uh, handpiece, uh, check the anatomy of the area, uh, check that the bladder is fine, there is nothing significant uh, in the bladder. And then after that, we start the planning of the uh, treatment uh, field. Uh, we try to avoid the bladder neck, so it's about one to two centimeter behind the bladder neck and about one to two centimeter away from the Vero Montana. Mm -hmm. And then it will go with the whole depth uh, of the prostate um, uh, by planning, and then it's attached to the robotic arm and the treatment uh, will start it. Uh, usually uh, it's a very fast treatment and uh, the one pass uh, of treatment is it will take something between eight to 10 minutes. Um, sometimes the prostate is large, we may need two or even three uh, passes. Uh, all the patients will need a catheter after the procedure, and it can be kept for three to five days, according depend on the uh, prostate uh, size. Uh, aqua ablation will uh, there is evidence for aqua ablation uh, came from a water uh, study and recently water two study. So in the water uh, study, uh, it was compared with the TRP, which showed non inferiority of the. Uh, aqua ablation in terms of uh, improvement on the QMAX, uh, IPSS, and the quality of life. And the aqua ablation showed a safer profile than the TRP and a good preservation of the erectile and ejaculatory uh, function. So the incidence of uh, retrograde ejaculation is something between uh, 7 to 10 percent with the uh, aqua ablation. And then recently they have the water 2 study which uh, consider um, aqua ablation for a prostate more than 80 mil, which showed also a promising results. Well done, well done. Uh, coming to the NICE guidance on aqua ablation, uh, what is the uh, 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 stand of NICE on aqua ablation? Uh, so again, it's considered mainly for patients with moderate to severe uh, symptom and, and prostate size between 30 uh, to 80 uh, mil. And uh, for the nice, uh, for in the in the uh, NHS hospitals, it should be done under clinical governance with audit and review of the clinical outcomes. Yes. And we have to ensure that the patients are aware that this this technology is still under the evolving phase, and the long term results are not yet known. Yeah. Definitely. Well done. Well done. Um, Going towards another exciting uh, option, prostate artery embolization. Can you tell me more about prostatic artery embolization? So prostate artery embolization is a procedure done by our interventional radiology uh, colleague. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the basic idea behind uh, prostate artery embolization well, uh, came from the uh, embolization of a large fibroid. So in the same principle, if we uh, embolize the feeding vessel for the prostate, this will cause a, 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 a necrosis of prostate tissue and then reduction in the size and improvement in the symptoms. Uh, it's mainly uh, considered for patients who are not fit for general anesthesia or patient who is having a larger prostate and he wants to preserve his uh, sexual function. Uh, NICE recommended prostate artery embolization for larger prostate more than um, 80 mil. And NICE recommend that the selection of the patient should be done by a urologist and interventional radiologist, and the procedure should be performed by experienced interventional uh, radiologist, and it needs to be performed in the uh, clinical uh, trial um, setting. Okay, well done. Uh, what are the different techniques used in the prostate artery embolization? Um, I am aware that there is a proximal uh, embolization and a distal embolization, and they can use a different uh, substance to perform the uh, uh, embolization. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, the procedure need to take about uh, one to two hour operative time, and the patient needs to stay in the department for about uh, four to six uh, hours. And uh, uh, the radiation exposure is one of the main concerns in this procedure. However, the UK uh, ROP study showed that the average radiation exposure 
uh, for this study is about uh, 44 milli SV. And uh, the time exposure time will increase more if the patient is having atherosclerosis or atherosclerosis uh, blood vessels. Okay, well done, well done. Uh, regarding the techniques, uh, because uh, there is a new evolution on the techniques. So it started, so there are two types. Initially, it was like the distal embolization, and then they found out that we can do proximal, which will give more area of, uh, I mean, uh, stopping the bleeding to the prostate. Uh, so um, there is distal to start with, and then it changed to proximal. And the latest one is a combination. So it is called perfected. So they do the proximal first, and then push the catheter again deeply to do the distal. Very good. Okay. And uh, yeah, absolutely spot on regarding the ROP study. I would suggest just to add a couple of things on the ROP study because it is a UK-based study. It was one of the earliest evidence and it was published in 2018. Uh, but the uh, thing that we had to uh, make sure is that it was only an observational study and it was a matching comparison. It was not an RCT, but it was just a comparison between PAE and the TRP. Yes. And in that one, the PAE provided clinically and statistically significant improvement in the symptoms and quality of life. Yeah. Well done um, for bringing those evidences. Yeah, thank you. But I think there's some concern about the durability of the uh, exactly. prostate artery embolization. Nowadays, they speak that uh, most of the patients, they may need a retreatment. Retreatment, yeah. yeah. So it is still in the evolving phase. That's why NICE still says that it has to be done in an arrangement where there, is a, there, where it is, there are clinical governance, the consent, and the audit are very carefully documented. Uh, and the most uh, widely uh, accepted new treatment, prostatic urethral lift. Uh, can you tell me uh, what, what is prostatic urethral lift? How does it work? So prostatic urethral lift or urolift, it uh, works by, <clears throat> by implanting um, uh, implantation device in the prostatic urethra, which will cause uh, retraction of the prostate uh, loops rather than uh, ablation uh, and improvement in the flow and uh, Qmax. Um, in the Eurolift, we are using uh, implant which is uh, composed of uh, a suture material which is polyethylene and uh, two caps. Uh, uh, so uh, sorry, two tabs. So the capsular uh, tab is made of uh, uh, nitinol and the. A urethral tab is made of stainless steel. Uh, it is uh, about uh, the length of the implant is uh, is about uh, one centimeter, uh, and will be implanted. And uh, the advantage of Eurolift is that it can be done under local anesthesia with or without sedation. Uh, it can be done as a day case. It doesn't need a, a catheter after the procedure most of the time and it will preserve uh, uh, sexual function, mainly the ejaculation. Uh, so these are the advantage. Um, uh, usually for uh, the patient who is candidate for Eurolift should have a prostate between 30 to 80 mil. And according to the NICE guideline, there should be no uh, obstructing median uh, loop. Uh, the procedure will be done under local anesthesia. Usually we prepare uh, some uh, chilled um, uh, lubricant gel like lidocaine, we keep it in the fridge uh, and then we use about 20 ml of uh, this lidocaine injected into the urethra 10 minutes before the procedure and then we use some uh, gauze or penile clamp to hold it inside the urethra, then start the procedure by giving the patient some uh, sedation and then we do cystoscopy. The, the urolift, they have their own uh, disposable application system which is used with a, a, a telescope, it is a 20 French size. Mm -hmm. So we will go with the um, uh, uh, application set, uh, have a good cystoscopy, assess the anatomy of the prostatic urethra, um, assess the bladder, make sure that there is nothing uh, wrong in the bladder. And then after that, we'll start the application. Usually we uh, apply uh, the um, uh, implant on the lateral aspect, usually around uh, 10, uh, around two and 10 o'clock. Uh, we need to push the prostate tissue a little bit gently with an angle of about a 20 degree. And then after that, we start releasing the implant. We do uh, one implant on the left and then one implant on the right. 
and then a second one on the left and then a second one uh, on the right. The usual uh, treatment uh, uh, include four uh, implant uh, uh, application. Uh, unfortunately, the set which is available now, it can apply one implant uh, per disposable set. So we need to change uh, the set with each application. However, um, in the EuroLeft 2 uh, model, which is uh, maybe uh, coming soon, they have a, a multi-loaded uh, application set which can apply a four implant using only uh, one set. Mm -hmm. uh, we assess the prostate cavity after that. Uh, uh, sometimes the prostate is very large. We may need to apply more than four sets. So we, we can apply six or eight um, uh, uh, implant of the, of the Eurolift. However, mm -hmm. it will not be cost effective if we apply more than uh, four uh, implant. If the prostate is small, we can uh, we don't have much area to apply the four implants, so we can use the stacking technique. So apply the um, uh, implant one over the other. Uh, so one will be at two o'clock, and the other one will be at five o'clock, and then at ten uh, and seven uh, o'clock. Um, it's a very rapid procedure. It take about less than ten minutes. Patient will be discharged on the home day on the same day uh, without a catheter. It associated with minimal complication, uh, so a retention rate of about five percent. The incidence of retrograde ejaculation is only two to three percent. There are some concern about the retreatment rate of your left, which may be a little bit higher than uh, other minimally invasive surgery, with a retreatment rate of about two to three percent per year. So that's about uh, fifteen percent in in uh, five years. We have the evidence for the euro left from the. Uh, lift study which is a five-year study comparing uh, euro lift to sham which showed the uh, effectiveness in uh, of euro lift in reducing the uh, ipss uh, improving the q max and improving the quality uh, of life uh, then we have a further confirmation from the bph6 study which compare euro lift to uh, 2rp in about 80 patients uh, and it showed that uh, uh, Eurolift achieve a, a good reduction in all parameters. However, TRP was um, uh, a little bit superior to Eurolift. Um, the safety for Eurolift was uh, better, and also uh, it it caused a rapid uh, onset of improvement in the symptoms uh, faster than uh, TRP. Um, then they pushed the boundaries more by uh, using the Eurolift for patients with urinary retention. And this is the Pulsar study, uh, which includes patients with urinary retention. And uh, again, the Eurolift should a uh, promising result with a catheter free rate of 60% in three days and 80% in uh, three months. Um, and the last study is the midlift, uh, where they consider uh, the Eurolift for a large median loop. Uh, so they have a special technique by compressing the median loop and then push it to one side and then we can apply the implant. And it should also um, a promising result even in patients with obstructing mid uh, median loop. Well done. Good evidences and uh, precise bringing out the uh, numbers on those evidences. Well done. Uh, what are the complications of PUL? Uh, the main complication um, is uh, relative urinary symptoms and hematuria, which happen for a few days. Uh, urinary retention, about 5% of the patient. Um, uh, the retrograde ejaculation in about 1 to 3% only. Retreatment rate of about 2 to 3% uh, per year. Uh, uh, the other thing is that sometimes it may cause pelvic pain as well for some of the patient. Uh, the main... Uh, the main trick in, in, in uh, Eurolift is that you can put the implant only once. So it needs to be inserted uh, properly because we don't have a, um, we can't go back and revise the position of the implant. So it needs to be applied. We need to get it right from the uh, first time. Okay, well done. Uh, what about, so we are going to, uh, going to a different scenario now. Uh, what about intra-prosthetic injections? Are they used now, or uh, what's the evidence for that? Um, previously, there were some trials on uh, intra-prosthetic injection of ethanol and then uh, intravasical Botox injection. However, NICE guidelines doesn't recommend any one of these since they are associated with a significant complication and there is 
uh, no much improvement in, 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 in outcome. So all these are not used currently. All right. What about ITIND? So the ITIND is one of the minimally invasive uh, treatment. It is a, a nitinol uh, cage composed of three fibers and a uh, base in a triradiant uh, shape. Uh, it can be uh, applied um, under general anesthesia, um, local anesthesia uh, with or without sedation. It will be applied under vision. So this uh, trident, trident uh, cage will be deployed into the bladder first, and then it will be pulled back into the uh, prosthetic fossa. So these three wires will cause a pressure necrosis, and then they will cause incision uh, in the prosthetic um, uh, tissue um, uh, over five to seven days, where we lift the uh, implant inside the patient, and then after five to seven patient, after five to seven days, uh, we uh, pull it out. So these three incisions in the prostate are supposed to improve uh, the flow rate, um, the Q max, uh, uh, IPSS, and the quality of life uh, for the patient. It associated with very minimal um, uh, side effect while the. Uh, nitinol implant is inside uh, the body, it will cause the uh, patient some uh, storage urinary symptoms and hematuria. Um, uh, however, after its removal, it showed some improvement. Unfortunately, we don't have a strong evidence for ITIN, so it is only uh, non-randomized, non-controlled, uh, small uh, study which showed its effect. However, it is approved by the uh, NICE guideline. Okay. Uh, what about allium? So allium is a, a form of prosthetic stent. Uh, it is um, take the shape of the uh, fish. So there is a, a long segment and a small segment. The small segment will be on the uh, uh, bulbar urethra, while the long segment will be on the prosthetic urethra and will keep uh, the urethra patent. So the main use is uh, in patients who are not fit for any uh, uh, surgical treatment and also a patient who is not uh, keen to keep a, a long-term enduring catheter. Uh, the stain, they have many problems uh, uh, like uh, infection, bleeding, uh, migration, uh, uh, incrustation, and incontinence. Well done. Uh, what about simple prostatectomy? So the simple prostatectomy is an option for a, a very large prostate, uh, more than uh, 80 to 100 gram. Uh, classically, it is performed via the open approach, which is either retropubic milling or transvasacal friar uh, prostectomy. However, recently, it is performed uh, robotically but with a good outcome. Okay, well done. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, we are now at the end of our discussion. Uh, really enjoyed it. Amazing discussion. Uh, it was very thorough. And uh, all the keywords, uh, no concerns at all. Uh, yeah, Ms. I think Mr. Dan Shagarin will give the feedback more. Thank you. Well done. Again, another very nice presentation, Ahmed. As uh, Anish said, no Thank concerns you. at any point. Um, if you can do at this level, I'm sure in the future months, things only will improve from here and you will get more confident. The only other thing which I wish you guys to know is uh, divide the minimally invasive techniques into practically applicable thing in day-to-day -day practice. Uh, I'm not discussing about monopolar or bipolar TURP or green light vaporization or hole up or thulium enucleation. They're all well established. Coming to the newer one, I think Eurolift and Resume are the only two things which any trust can start, any consultant can get trained and start without much supervision. But of course, it's always a nice practice to maintain an audit to see their own results. If you go for ITINT or aquablation, you need a governance approval. It has to be done under the cover of audit and governance. Coming to very new things like stents, it's more for palliation when the patient is not really fit for anything. Intraprostatic injections are completely out of the block. It's not practically uh, doable I'm even for unfit patient. So get the overall preamble of this idea. Good. Very good. Thanks so much. Yeah, well done. Yeah.
very good yeah. have a good rest of the day and i will continue thanks. with a different topic with you okay thank you very much thanks so much thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. thank you bye bye have a nice day